Wilderness Letter to David E. Pesanen, Wildland Research Center, University of California, Berkeley. Dear Mr. Pesanen, I believe that you are working on the wilderness portion of the Outdoor Recreation Resources Review Commission's report. If I may, I should like to urge some arguments for wilderness preservation that involve recreation as it is ordinarily conceived, hardly at all. Hunting, fishing, hiking, mountain climbing, camping, photography, and the enjoyment of natural scenery will all surely figure in your report. So will the wilderness as a genetic reserve, a scientific yardstick by which we may measure the world in its natural balance against the world in its man-made imbalance. What I want to speak for is not so much the wilderness uses, valuable as those are, but the wilderness idea, which is a resource in itself. Being an intangible and spiritual resource, it will seem mystical to the practical-minded, but then anything that cannot be moved by a bulldozer is likely to seem mystical to them. I want to speak for the wilderness idea as something that has helped form our character and that has certainly shaped our history as a people. It has no more to do with recreation than churches have to do with recreation, or than the strenuousness and optimism and expansiveness of what historians call the American dream have to do with recreation. Nevertheless, it is only in this recreation survey that the values of wilderness are being compiled, and I hope you will permit me to insert this idea between the leaves, as it were, of the recreation report. Something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed, if we permit the last virgin forest to be turned into comic books and plastic cigarette cases, if we drive the few remaining members of the wild species into zoos or to extinction, if we pollute the last clear air and dirty the last clean streams and push our paved roads through the last of the silence, so that never again will Americans be free in their own country from the noise, the exhausts, the stinks of human and automotive waste, and so that never again can we have the chance to see ourselves single, separate, vertical, and individual in the world, part of the environment of trees and rocks and soil, brother to the other animals, part of the natural world, and competent to belong in it. Without any remaining wilderness, we are committed wholly without chance for even momentary reflection and rest to a headlong drive into our technological termite life, the brave new world of a completely man-controlled environment. We need wilderness preserved, as much of it as is still left, and as many kinds, because it was the challenge against which our character as a people was formed. The reminder and reassurance that it is still there is good for our spiritual health, even if we never once in ten years set foot in it. It is good for us when we are young because of the incomparable sanity it can bring briefly as vacation and rest into our insane lives. It is important to us when we are old simply because it is there. Important, that is, simply as idea. We are a wild species, as Darwin pointed out. Nobody ever tamed or domesticated or scientifically bred us. But for at least three millennia, we have been engaged in a cumulative and ambitious race to modify and gain control of our environment. And in the process, we have come close to domesticating ourselves. Not many people are likely anymore to look upon what we call progress as an unmixed blessing. Just as surely as it has brought us increased comfort and more material goods, it has brought us spiritual losses and it threatens now to become the Frankenstein that will destroy us. One means of sanity is to retain a hold on the natural world, to remain, insofar as we can, good animals. Americans still have that chance more than many people, for while we were demonstrating ourselves the most efficient and ruthless environment busters in history, and slashing and burning and cutting our way through a wilderness continent, the wilderness was working on us, it remains in us as surely as Indian names remain on the land. If the abstract dream of human liberty and human dignity became in America something more than an abstract dream, mark it down at least partially to the fact that we were in subtle ways subdued by what we conquered. The Connecticut Yankees sending likely candidates from King Arthur's unjust kingdom to his man factory for rehabilitation was over-optimistic, as he later admitted. These things cannot be forced. They have to grow. To make such a man, such a Democrat, such a believer in human individual dignity as Mark Twain himself, the frontier was necessary. Hannibal and the Mississippi and Virginia City. And reaching out from those, the wilderness. The wilderness as opportunity and as idea. 
the thing that has helped to make an American different from and until we forget it in the roar of our industrial cities, more fortunate than other men. For an American, insofar as he is new and different at all, is a civilized man who has renewed himself in the wild. The American experience has been the confrontation by old peoples and cultures of a world as new as if it had just risen from the sea. That gave us our hope and our excitement, and the hope and excitement can be passed on to newer Americans, Americans who never saw any phase of the frontier, but only so long as we keep the remainder of our wild as a reserve and a promise, a sort of wilderness bank. For myself, I grew up on the empty plains of Saskatchewan and Montana and in the mountains of Utah, and I put a very high valuation on what those places gave me. And if I had not been able periodically to renew myself in the mountains and deserts of Western America, I would be very nearly bug house. Even when I can't get to the back country, the thought of the colored deserts of southern Utah or the reassurance that there are still stretches of prairie where the world can be instantaneously perceived as disc and bowl and where the little but intensely important human being is exposed to the five directions and the 36 winds is a positive consolation. The idea alone can sustain me. But as the wilderness areas are progressively exploited or improved, as the jeeps and bulldozers of uranium prospectors scar up the deserts and the roads are cut into the alpine timberlands, and as the remnants of the unspoiled and natural world are progressively eroded, every such loss is a little death in me, in us. Let me say something on the subject of the kinds of wilderness worth preserving. Most of those areas contemplated are in the national forest and in the high mountain country. For all the usual recreational purposes, the alpine and forest wildernesses are obviously the most important, both as genetic banks and as beauty spots. But for the spiritual renewal, the recognition of identity, the birth of awe, other kinds will serve every bit as well. Perhaps because they are less friendly to life, more abstractly non-human, they will serve even better. On our Saskatchewan prairie, the nearest neighbor was four miles away, and at night we saw only two lights on all the dark, rounding earth. The earth was full of animals, field mice, ground squirrels, weasels, ferrets, badgers, coyotes, burrowing owls, snakes. I knew them as my little brothers, as fellow creatures, and I have never been able to look upon animals in any other way since. The sky in that country came clear down to the ground on every side, and it was full of great weathers and clouds and winds and hawks. I hope I learned something from knowing intimately the creatures of the earth. I hope I learned something from looking a long way, from looking up, from being much alone. A prairie like that, one big enough to carry the eye clear to the sinking, rounding horizon, can be as lonely and grand and simple in its forms as the sea. It is as good a place as any for the wilderness experience to happen. The vanishing prairie is as worth preserving for the wilderness idea as the alpine forests. So are the great reaches of our western deserts, scarred somewhat by prospectors, but otherwise open, beautiful, waiting, close to whatever god you want to see in them. Just as a sample, let me suggest the robber's roost country in Wayne County, Utah, near the Capitol Reef National Monument. In that desert climate, the dozer and jeep tracks will not soon melt back into the earth. But the country has a way of making the scars insignificant. It's a lovely and terrible wilderness, such a wilderness as Christ and the prophets went out into, harshly and beautifully colored, broken and worn until its bones are exposed, its great sky without a smudge or taint from technocracy. And in hidden corners and pockets under its cliffs, the sudden poetry of springs. Save a piece of country like that intact, and it does not matter in the slightest that only a few people every year will go into it. That is precisely its value. Roads would be a desecration. Crowds would ruin it. But those who haven't the strength or youth to go into it and live can simply sit and look. They can look 200 miles clear into Colorado. And looking down over the cliffs and canyons of the San Rafael Swell and the Robber's Roost, they can also look as deeply into themselves as anywhere I know. And if they can't even get to the places on the Aquarius Plateau where the present roads will carry them, they can simply contemplate the idea, take pleasure in the fact that such a timeless and uncontrolled part of the earth is still there. 
These are some of the things wilderness can do for us. That is the reason we need to put into effect for its preservation some other principle than the principles of exploitation or usefulness or even recreation. We simply need that wild country available to us, even if we never do more than drive to its edge and look in, for it can be a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures, a part of the geography of hope. Very sincerely yours, Wallace Stegner.